Just imagine running a race. And just before you cross the finish, you take over the person that's in the second position. Now imagine where you are on the podium. I'm pretty sure most of you just envisioned yourself winning the race. But I'm sorry, you're wrong. You came in second. That's because when you take over the second place, there's still someone in front of you leading the race, and that person is going to win. What just happened here is I triggered your intuitive brain. And your intuitive brain is made for speed and not for accuracy. So when this question, it seems very simple, and there is a sequence from two to one, your unconscious brain doesn't activate your deliberate thinking, your deliberate thinking that is slow, but much more accurate. Completely different question. OK, so who of you is less capable in detecting disinformation online than the average person in this room? Hands, please. So, yeah, so this is interesting, because if I would divide this room in a group that is less or better capable in detecting disinformation compared to the average, approximately half of the crowd should have just risen their hand. The thing is, we cannot really estimate our own capabilities very well especially if we lack the knowledge or the expertise. This is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. So these are just two examples that I wanted to show that our thinking is very much subjective, and we're not as rational as we would like to believe we are. I found this out when I was in Afghanistan in 2007. I was working in um, Chora, um, in Urzgan, in the middle of nowhere. I was in the military, and I had to work with local men on projects to improve the living conditions of the area, an area that you could describe as having missed the Industrial Revolution, except for mobile phones, some motorcycles, and, of course, a lot of AK-47s. It's an automatic rifle, also known as Kalashnikov. So we are driving the whole day. And we end up at the governor's compound in Chora, and we sleep there, all the military in the same room. The next morning, we go on a foot patrol. And this is the first time there's a woman part of the mission. And when we walk around, I hear people whispering and laughing, and I ask my interpreter, what are they talking about? And he tells me, I can't tell you, because you'll probably be insulted. But I. I insisted because I needed to know. And then he said, OK, let me tell you this. Um, they think the military is here for a longer period than they normally do. And I couldn't really make sense of it. And then all of a sudden, I got it. They thought I was a prostitute. <laughs> and it intrigued me because I realized I didn't understand how they see the world and that their view of the same situation is completely different than mine. And when I talked to my colleagues, they were saying things like, they're just stupid, it's medieval, they're retarded. A whore on a patrol. Thinking about it, it makes a lot of sense. The thing was just that, in general, we just didn't understand the people their struggles, and the conflict. And that made us make decisions that were horrible. And also, because of that, I learned, while lying on the ground, that Hollywood special effects are very much realistic. Back home, I went back on with my career, and. More and more, I felt the urge to understand why do people do what they do. And then, one year before I started studying sociology, I was living in Damascus when the Arab Spring broke out. So online originated protests, sparked unrest in the whole region, and within weeks, we were isolated in the city. It was interesting to be in the middle of all these different narratives, the narratives from the protesters, 
from Al Jazeera news outlets, from people at home, but also the Assad followers. They all had their own beliefs, ideas, perceptions of exactly the same situation. And I was in the middle of it. This made me want to study how online behavior has an impact offline. So that's what I did. And an interesting thing I found out is the internet has the potential to find out basically everything you want to know. But the thing is, we see only a fraction of it. And this is because there is just too much. There is so much information that our unconscious brain helps us to decide what we see and what not. It uses filters to make us aware of certain information and ignore others. So, for instance, things that trigger our emotions definitely are picked up by our brain. And then we have a preference for binary stories, stories that are about good and bad, not too much nuances and not too much complexity, because that is easily to digest, like fairy tales or conspiracy beliefs. Another thing is called confirmation bias. We notice primarily information that aligns with the things we already believe or know, and then we add more value and truth to repetitive messages. They could be misleading, but it's called the illusory truth effect. Thing is, as said before, we're not as rational as we think, and the way we see the world is very much subjective. And the fact that we have a biased brain is not the problem on itself. Online models learn from our behavior, and they more and more serve us information that we like to consume, leading to a narrow and more narrow view of the world every time, and ending up in groups of like-minded people that are opposed to the others. We're seduced to have an opinion about basically everything and anything that's happening online. It creates polarization and hate, with diverse us only more. And the thing is, we're not online to get information or facts. Most of us spend a lot of time there because it brings us identity and belonging and meaning. That is what it provides to us. Facts are not that important. Especially in times of great insecurity and uncertainty, it's meaning that people are looking for, belonging. And in times of insecurity and uncertainty, we are less critical and we respond more emotionally. While especially in these circumstances, we should be more critical and more aware of how we spend our time online. So I think we should realize how we spend our time online and be more aware how we can spend it in a different way and have it be more meaningful. So with this whole online environment, the amount of information and the technology, the growth of artificial intelligence had made, has made us to be more vulnerable to be manipulated. And we're manipulated all the time. And it has harmful impact. Young people that are recruited by criminal gangs online to earn 10K in a week. Frustrated people that vote on political parties that want to end immigration based on framed facts and random juggling with numbers. People that click on screaming headlines unaware that they just are funding a juice channel that's spreading lies about people. And the increase of online hate, having a causal relation to, online, to offline violent crimes, hate crimes, and every victim is just one too many. And I could go on and on, 
with how online manipulation and disinformation plays a big role in war, in genocide, in dictatorship, in extremism, in the suppression of people. I think it's time that the most people I know and I see and I'm convinced that want an online environment that is empathic, that is about conversation and not about hate and polarization. So what we can do is when you're online and you feel it triggers your emotions, zoom out. Why are you triggered? What does the sender want? And what is the whole story? And when you hear yourself think, hmm, but where's smoke, there's probably fire. Let me tell you, online, where there's smoke, there's smoke. <laughs> and this is a very well-known technique to mislead people. So when you feel, hey, there's smoke, go look for the fire and don't assume that it's there. Be critical. Be critical about accounts. Search for a first and a last name. Look at the other connections that they have. Look in the comments. Especially since Twitter sold out the blue marks for only $8. Then search not just for proof, but for counter arguments. Because let me tell you, if you search for proof, you can also prove the earth is flat and Elvis is still alive. <laughs> the funny thing is, when I started studying sociology, social psychology, and doing behavioral research, I found out this wasn't just about people. It was as much about me, about why I do what I do. And ignorance is bliss. I mean, things you don't know, you can't be bothered with, right? But on the other hand, it's confronting to know you're biased. And it's confronting to know that you're not flawless. But to me, this provides the motivation to do better, to contribute to an online environment that is more fair and inclusive. And I don't think it's actually that hard. Let's just all start to be more critical, curious, and kind. Let's just start there.